Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm continuing on with chapter one of Answers Book One from AIG. Last time, we were using statements made by one Lee Spetner from a book in which he fully admitted that he wanted the Neo-Darwinian theory to be wrong for religious reasons, as evidence that evolution as a whole is wrong. And remember, this is in chapter one, which is titled, Is There Really a God? AIG tries to tie evolution into the god question, but in reality they just are not linked. They want you to think that if they somehow poke enough holes in evolution, then creation, by their specific god, is the only other option. But even if you manage to disprove every single aspect of evolution, that would do nothing to demonstrate the existence of a god, much less specifically AIG's version of god. So let's see if they get any better in the rest of this chapter. More problems. Imagine yourself sitting in the seat of a 747 airplane, reading about the construction of this great plane. You are fascinated by the fact that this flying machine is made up of six million parts, but then you realize that not one part by itself flies. This realization can be rather disconcerting if you are flying along at 805 kilometers per hour at 10,000 meters. That is a concept known as gestalt, the idea that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. There are many examples, both natural and man-made, of gestalts. This is but one. We can use the construction of an airplane as an analogy to understand the basic mechanisms of the biochemistry of cells that enable organisms to function. So irreducible complexity then? That's where you're going with this? Scientists have found that within the cell there are thousands of what can be called biochemical machines. For example, one could cite the cell's ability to sense light and turn it into electrical impulses. But what scientists once thought was a simple process within a cell, such as being able to sense light and turn it into electrical impulses, is in fact a highly complicated event. Did scientists ever think that these events were simple? I mean, I know at one point in between the discovery of the cell and the discovery of structures like mitochondria and chromosomes that cells were thought to be gelatinous blobs of sorts, but once we figured out that there's more going on in the cells, I don't think anyone proposed that it was all relatively simple. And actually I'm going to have to re-examine my idea that we thought cells were kind of gelatinous because it occurs to me that the only place I've heard that is from creationists talking about how in Darwin's time we didn't think there was anything in cells, they were just blobs. But cell theory, as it turns out, was developed in the 1830s, just before Darwin published The Voyage of the Beagle, and the cell nucleus was discovered in 1833. Now certainly our knowledge of cells did increase greatly during Darwin's lifetime, but I don't think we started with the idea that it was a homogenous jelly, at least not while Darwin was around. For just this one example alone to work, numerous compounds must be all in the right place, at the right time, in the right concentration, or it just won't happen. Bacterial rhodopsin is the only protein needed to produce photosensitivity in halobacterium. Bacterial rhodopsin is a proton pump. That is, when stimulated by photons, it kicks protons out of the cell through the membrane. The resulting proton gradient is then converted into chemical energy, and boom, we have a rudimentary, not quite vision, but photosensitivity. To get from something this simple to the eyes that we have today only requires minor modifications over time. No one generation would have to have some big leap from just a light sensitive spot to full on color vision. Now, now, this system does require ATP as an energy source, so you might then ask, how did ATP synthesis evolve? But that is a completely separate question. This definitely is not the only function of ATP, and ATP synthesis definitely would have come before vision, so for the purposes of the evolution of the eye, ATP was there right from the start. But if you really want to know how ATP synthesis evolved, we do have some pretty good ideas of how that happened as well. Long story short, the first cells to use ATP would likely have acquired it through fermentation of sugars. In other words, just as all the parts of a 747 need to be assembled before it can fly, so all the parts of these biochemical machines and cells need to be in place or they can't function. Can't function in the exact same way as they do today, sure, but there are lots of things that you could build out of the parts of a 747, none of which fly, all of which could have some function or other. A jet engine by itself with no wings or fuselage could be used to power a land vehicle, which could be built out of the wheels and some of the other parts of the fuselage of the plane. 
the fuselage itself could be used as a house, and has been on at least a couple of occasions. Maybe not exactly the 747, but the same principle applies. But if we really want to stick with things that have been done with 747 parts, the wings of a 747 have been used as a roof for this house, so there's that. My point is, there are plenty of uses for the parts of a 747 that don't necessarily involve flying. And there are literally thousands of such machines in a single cell that are vital for it to operate. What does this mean? Quite simply, evolution from chemicals to a living system is impossible. No, that's not what it means. It means that you are garbage at coming up with analogies. Obviously, the first cells would not have been as complicated as modern cells. If we're looking at the evolution of flight, why not at least try to be analogous and instead of just saying, no single part of a 747 can fly by itself, compare the 747 to the earliest flying machines that eventually led us to developing powered flight. Of the first few batches of flying machines, none of them accomplish what we might call flight today, and none of them used 747 parts. But several of them use parts that we now recognize as the precursors to parts that can be found in a 747, though much simpler. Wings, wheels, cockpit, engines, all the rudiments of powered flight are there. Then, as time went on, our flying machines got more and more complicated, going from the Wright Brothers' fairly simple plane, to a single prop airplane, to multi-engines, to jets, to the 747, with many transitional steps in between. Of course, this analogy is still imperfect, but at least it gets us to the general idea of change over time with a trend toward increased complexity. Scientists now know that life is built on these machines. Dr. Michael Behe, Associate Professor of Biochemistry at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, describes these biochemical machines as examples of irreducible complexity. Yeah, there you go. Irreducible complexity and its primary promoter, Michael Behe. The man who literally sat in front of a pile of books and papers describing the evolution of the immune system, ignored them, and said, nah, it couldn't have evolved, it's too complex. And he starts to pile these up on Behe's witness stand. Eventually, Behe was almost dwarfed by the stack of scientific literature on the evolutionary origin of the immune system. All these hard-working scientists published article after article over years and years, chapters and books, full books, addressing the question of how the vertebrate immune system evolved. But none of them are satisfactory to you. I'm skipping the Behe quote, it can be summarized as, we discovered that things are complex, therefore they are irreducibly complex. To illustrate this further, consider swatting a mosquito. Then think about this question. Why did the mosquito die? You see, the squash mosquito has all the chemicals for life that an evolutionist could ever hope for in some primordial soup. Yet we know that nothing is going to evolve from this mosquito soup, so why did the mosquito die? This is a really weird analogy. I don't think anyone who works in the field of abiogenesis would tell you that all you need are the organic molecules themselves. You also need the correct environment to continue producing these organic molecules. For instance, on the early Earth, there was likely a significant amount of cyanide that would have rained on volcanically active areas that are rich in iron. Cyanide and iron would continuously react with each other to form simple sugars, which could then react with phosphate to form the RNA nucleotides. The energy from these reactions could have come from UV light from the sun, heat from the volcanic environment, lightning, or some combination of the three. But the key here is the continuous production. It wasn't some one-off event. It was a long-term reaction involving many different pieces. So while a squished mosquito does have all the components required for life, it will not spontaneously produce new life because it is not in an environment conducive to the continued production of these components. So once they break down, they're gone. But even then, it could be argued that the mosquito does then produce life, as the main reason it will break down is not due to time wearing away at it, but rather because other organisms will eat it. These organisms will then break the mosquito down into its component parts and use those parts to build themselves, spontaneously turning the dead parts of the mosquito into a living organism. At a cellular level, literally thousands of machines need to exist before life ever becomes possible. Not necessarily. Depends how you define life, too. That's kind of a blurry line at times. But demonstrations have been made of protocells that act in very lifelike ways with as few as five chemicals. And no chemical machines. 
We have simple chemistry, and it can do things like solve mazes, eat, reproduce, and engage in collective behavior. But there is no genetic material here, so it doesn't really qualify as alive, because reproduction doesn't include the inheritance of traits in the same way as life does. It would be more akin to how fire can be said to reproduce. But it is a starting point. This means that evolution from chemicals is impossible. No, at worst it means that we don't know exactly how it happened. You just like to take that we don't know to its extreme in order to claim that we can't know, therefore it must have been God. A greater problem still. Some scientists and educators have tried to get around the above problems by speculating that as long as all the chemicals that make up the molecule of heredity and the information it contains came together at some time in the past, then life could have begun. I mean, kinda? Now, sure, we don't know exactly how, but the only thing you're accomplishing here is to say that we don't know. And that's literally the whole point of science. Researchers don't research things that we already know for sure, they research things that we don't know with the hopes of learning new things. Life is built upon information. In fact, in just one of the trillions of cells that make up the human body, the amount of information in its genes would fill at least 1,000 books of 500 pages of typewritten information. Scientists now think that this is hugely underestimated. Which scientists? Who is researching the quantity of information contained in our cells? And how are you quantifying this information? And most importantly, why does it matter that if you change the format of the information, it would then be in a different format? Also, are we talking about unique information here? I imagine that would be rather important, because the whole human genome will add up to about 725 megabytes of data, not huge by today's standards, but not insignificant either. However, because of how little variation there is between different human genomes, it is possible to losslessly compress the entire genome to 4 megabytes. But of course, this is all entirely meaningless without more information about how you are using the word information. Information. Where did all this information come from? Some try to explain it this way. Imagine a professor taking all the letters of the alphabet A through Z and placing them in a hat. He then passes the hat around to the students of his class and asks each to randomly select a letter. It is easy for us to see the possibility, no matter how remote it seems, of three students in a row selecting B, then A, and finally T. Put these letters together and they spell a word, bat. I've heard similar analogies, but you seem to be butchering it in a very specific way. It's not about the three students getting a word on the first try, it's about having multiple tries, holding on to the letters that work for whatever purposes you have in mind, and then trying again. Eventually, if you have the whole alphabet at your disposal, you can go from a random mess to the complete works of Shakespeare. The main problem with this analogy is that it places a final goal on the letters, while natural selection has no ultimate goal. It just selects for whatever organisms are good enough at surviving long enough to reproduce. Thus, the professor concludes, given enough time, no matter how improbable it seems, there is always the possibility one could form a series of words that makes a sentence, and eventually compile an encyclopedia. The students are then led to believe that no intelligence is necessary in the evolution of life from chemicals. As long as the molecules come together in the right order for such compounds as DNA, then life could have begun. Well, usually this analogy is used to explain how life went from whatever the first life was to the massive amounts of complexity and diversity that we have today, rather than being used for abiogenesis itself. But sure, I suppose it is a decent analogy to abiogenesis. Just keep in mind that abiogenesis most likely happens cyclically. Whether it be tides from the moon, pools being rained into and evaporated out of, or any other mechanism, there is usually some cycle or other that works to concentrate the chemicals. If, as part of the cycle, the right chemicals and molecules started to form, then it does stand to reason that, as the cycle goes on, they'll have more and more interactions over time. This is a decidedly less than perfect analogy for abiogenesis, but it does kind of work. Except, of course, AIG isn't presenting the best version of this analogy, instead leaving out key details in order to make it look absurd. On the surface, this sounds like a logical argument. However, there is a basic fatal flaw in this analogy. The sequence of the letters B-A-T is a word to whom? Someone who speaks English? Dutch? French? German? Chinese? It is a word only to someone who knows the language. 
In other words, the order of the letters is meaningless unless there is a language system and a translation system already in place to make the order meaningful. So to translate out of Answers in Genesis Ease, DNA uses molecular mechanisms as part of its replication that wouldn't have existed in the first life, which is one of the reasons that the RNA world hypothesis is so popular, because RNA as a molecule can behave both as a protein, carry heritable information, and can catalyze its own replication. Now, of course, RNA is too complicated and unstable to be a likely candidate for the very first self-replicating molecule. It was probably something simpler than that, possibly polymers that resemble RNA but are chemically simpler. But over billions of years of evolution, these simpler molecules just no longer exist in present-day cells, but they are a plausible pathway to RNA, which is itself a plausible pathway to DNA. And I'm going to go ahead and skip the section where they talk about how DNA requires other molecular machines in order to replicate and transcribe proteins, but that is exactly where they go with it, and naturally they make no mention of RNA or RNA-like polymers. Can information arise from non-information? We have already shown that information cannot come from mutations, a so-called mechanism of evolution. No, you didn't. See part two of this series for more information. But is there any other possible way information could arise from matter? This is when it is important to figure out what you mean by information, because literally every atom in the universe contains information, and the information changes as these atoms spontaneously interact with other atoms, not to mention all the quantum particles and fields and all that which also contain information which is in a constant state of flux. The fact that creationists rely on an intuitive feeling about what information is when talking about how impossible it is for information to spontaneously form is quite telling, because even a cursory glance at the literature about information will show your intuitions to be quite mistaken. A code system is always the result of a mental process. It requires an intelligent origin or inventor. That's nice. Now, who said anything about a code system? I know you want us to assume that DNA is a code, but it's really not. It can sometimes be analogized to computer code to help us conceptualize how it works, but ultimately it is not a code. It is a chemical which engages in chemical reactions. What, then, is the source of the information? We can therefore conclude that the huge amount of information in living things must originally have come from an intelligence, which had to have been far superior to ours. I mean, we can't, but let's just assume that you are right. This then leaves us with the question, where did this greater intelligence get its information? All information had to come from somewhere. Why is God exempt from that requirement? If the amount of information contained in biological systems needed a more complex source, then why does this complex source not also need a source? This is where the special pleading comes in. But then, some will say, that such a source would have to be caused by something with even greater information slash intelligence. <gasps> How did you know? However, if they reasoned this way, one could ask where even this greater information slash intelligence came from. And then where did that one come from? One could extrapolate to infinity, unless there was a source of infinite intelligence beyond our finite understanding. But isn't this what the Bible indicates when we read, in the beginning, God? Exactly. Special pleading. My source gets to be the ultimate source, because I said so, and my personal favorite religious text backs me up on that. If we both agree that it had to start somewhere, I appeal to the singularity before the Big Bang as that place where it stops. You, despite your protestations to the contrary, still have this singularity. You just decide to take it one step further and say that God is where it stops, not the singularity. Why? Why do you get that extra step? How is this extra step indicated? I mean, aside from your baseless claim that information is necessarily a code of some kind, and codes always come from a mind, of course. The God of the Bible is not bound by limitations of time, space, or anything else. And for all we know, neither is the singularity. One of these is an extra assumption that has no evidence backing it up. Which one is that? So what is the logically defensible position? Is it that matter has eternally existed or come into existence by itself for no reason, and then that by itself matter was arranged into information systems against everything observed in real science? Or did an eternal being, the god of the Bible, the source of infinite intelligence, create information systems for life to exist which agrees with real science? 
There has been no real science brought up in this chapter so far that actually agrees with what you're saying here. Sure, there have been a few out-of-context quotes from people saying things that seem to point to that if you ignore the larger context, and you've relied extensively on Werner Gitt's baseless constraints on information theory, but you haven't actually done anything to demonstrate that the singularity or the original life form do not agree with science. But then you pretend that you have, and thereby declare God to be the only possible alternative. If real science supports the Bible's claims about an eternal creator God, then why isn't this readily accepted? Michael Behe answers with this. The fourth and most powerful reason for science reluctance to embrace a theory of intelligent design is also based on philosophical considerations. Many people, including many important and well-respected scientists, just don't want there to be anything beyond nature. They don't want a supernatural being to affect nature, no matter how brief or constructive the interaction may have been. So, to rephrase, in order to support your belief in creation, you have to assume the motivations of literally millions of scientists, many of whom would actually agree with you that there was a god that created the universe, but your thing doesn't work unless you get to say that they don't want there to be a god. I feel like the discovery that God is real would be one of the most exciting scientific breakthroughs in history, and the scientists that made that discovery would go down in history. But sure, all the scientists of the last 150 years have just been a bunch of petulant children who don't want to believe that God is real, even though many of them have actually been religious, so they refuse to even consider God as an option. Sorry, but you lose by default when you have to assume the motives of your opposition in order for your argument to work. In other words, they bring a priori philosophical commitment to their science that restricts what kinds of explanations they will accept about the physical world. Sometimes this leads to rather odd behavior. Footnote 29. The crux of the matter is this. If one accepts that there is a God who created us, then that God also owns us. If this God is the God of the Bible, he owns us and thus has a right to set the rules by which we must live. Leaving aside for a moment the question of the morality of owning sapient beings as property, spoiler, it's not moral, but setting that aside, language is often used by ministries such as AIG revolving around life being God's gift to us. Life is our gift from God. Well, it's not much of a gift if he gets to dictate exactly how we have to use it in order to make him happy. A true gift does not have stipulations and expectations, it's just a gift. And as Proverbs 25.14 says, Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of a gift he does not give. So if we accept that God has given us life as a precious gift, then what we do with it is not up to him, it's up to us, or it's not really a gift. More important, he also tells us in the Bible that we are in rebellion against him, our creator. Because of this rebellion, called sin, our physical bodies are sentenced to death, but we will live on forever, either with God or without him, in a place of judgment. So, it's a gift that he will take back if you don't use it right. Moreover, he'll torture you for all eternity if you used it wrong. Some gift. God is the foundation for science and reason. As stated before, the Bible takes God's existence as a given. It never attempts to prove the existence of God, and this for a very good reason. Is the very good reason the fact that he doesn't exist and therefore can't be proven to exist? Because that's what it looks like to me. When we logically prove a particular thing, we show that it must be true because it follows logically from something authoritative. But there is nothing more authoritative than God and his word. In other words, just trust that the book is telling the truth, because it came from the ultimate authority who we dare not question. How do we know it came from the ultimate authority? Well, it says so, obviously. Circular reasoning with a dash of special pleading. God knows absolutely everything, so it makes sense to base our worldview on what God has written in his word. If I grant that a god exists and that he does know absolutely everything, that still doesn't necessarily follow. We first must determine what god's goals are. If he's a mischievous god and just wants to have a laugh at our expense, then maybe writing a book like the Bible to see how many people he can trick into believing ridiculous things like young earth creationism is his goal, and therefore we cannot trust anything that he writes. Some people claim that it is unscientific to start from God's word, but in reality, nothing could be further from the truth. A belief in God is actually foundational to logical thought and scientific inquiry. The book of Genesis literally tells a story of how a guy bred spotted sheep by having them mate in front of peeled sticks. 
because the authors of the Bible didn't have a clue how genetics work. You won't find anything anywhere in the Bible that can tell us anything about genetics. So no, it does not make sense to start with the Bible when researching genetics. Genesis also says quite clearly that the stars were put into heaven specifically for signs. You're supposed to be able to use astrology to achieve reliable results. Astrology is completely nonsense, so no, it does not make sense to start with the Bible when researching anything about the stars. How about medicine? Nothing useful. Chemistry? Nope. Physics? Definitely not. Think about it. Why is logical reasoning possible? There are laws of logic that we use when we reason. For example, there is the law of non-contradiction, which states that you can't have A and not A at the same time in the same relationship. We all know that this is true. But why is it true, and how do we know it? Best case scenario here is that you are using an argument from ignorance. We don't know why it is true, therefore God. We know it because we worked it out for ourselves. Do you have evidence that without a God it would not be true? Or is that a pure assumption on your part? And if you are appealing to a God to make the laws of logic work, then does that mean that they do not apply to God? Usually the answer to the question, can God make a rock so heavy he can't lift it, is that God can only do that which is logically possible for him to do, which would mean that God is also subject to the laws of logic, so they must be beyond even God. It seems to me that these laws of logic are the way they are for reasons that are beyond God's control. Otherwise, it would be possible for God to do logically impossible things, like make a rock so heavy that even he cannot lift it. So, at best here, you get us to an unknown and possibly unknowable force that is making the laws of logic behave as they are that is beyond even God. The Bible makes sense of this. God is self-consistent. He is non-contradictory, and so this law follows from God's nature. But why is God non-contradictory? What makes him non-contradictory? And why would the laws of logic necessarily follow from his nature? Is he unable to make a universe that would be contradictory? Would it somehow contradict his nature to do so? And if God can make a non-contradictory universe because his nature is so non-contradictory, why could he not make a non-contradictory book? He is all-powerful. Was he for some reason just unable to make a book that avoids even the appearance of contradiction? Why? And God has made us in his image, so we instinctively know this law. It has been hardwired into us. Or, our experience of reality consistently follows these laws, and so there was no evolutionary advantage to be gained from intuitively thinking otherwise. So evolution favored the organisms whose intuition matched with reality. Logical reasoning is possible because God is logical and has made us in his image. That does not logically follow. Of course, because of the curse, we sometimes make mistakes in logic. Of course. The curse. The catch-all excuse for when there are clear flaws in your position. It's a tidy little way of making your argument completely unfalsifiable and thereby useless. Why are our morals universal if not for God writing them on our hearts? Well, they aren't universal. Oh, well, obviously the areas of disagreement are because of the fall. Why do we intuitively understand logic? Lots of people don't, and falling into cognitive biases and logical fallacies is a huge problem for many, if not most, people. Well, the fall, obviously. If I'm right, it proves I'm right. And if I'm wrong, it still proves I'm right. But if the universe were merely a chance accident, then why should logical reasoning be possible? If the universe were merely a chance accident, why would it necessarily be impossible? If my brain is merely the product of mutations guided only by natural selection, then why should I think that it can determine what is true? Because in most scenarios, believing true things has a survival advantage. Of course, there are instances when believing a false thing can have a survival advantage, and that's where assigning agency comes in. If we assume that there is an agent behind something that we see, we are more likely to take defensive actions that could protect us from a hostile agent. And if we were wrong, no biggie, we still survive. If we were right, though, and it was an agent, then the ones who assume it was not are less prepared and therefore less likely to survive the encounter with said agent. This selection pressure that pushes us to identify agency where none necessarily exists is a pretty good explanation, in my opinion, for where religion comes from in the first place. 
So my worldview accounts for the existence not only of my worldview, no problem, but it also explains the existence of your worldview. Well, your worldview explicitly states that my worldview cannot even exist. Well, my worldview does exist, therefore yours is wrong. Likewise, only a biblical worldview can really account for the existence of science, the study of the natural world. Yes, sure. Only a belief that there is some magic dude who magicked everything into existence and regularly messes with the laws of physics can possibly account for the study of the natural world as it behaves without any apparent influence of this magic dude. Yeah, that's not a charitable way to state AIG's position, but ultimately they believe that there is a guy who, on a whim, can change all the laws of physics in whatever way he wants without it being possible to account for these changes scientifically. And the statement they just made was essentially that this definitionally unscientific approach is the only way it's even possible to do science. Science depends on the fact that the universe obeys orderly laws which do not arbitrarily change. And your worldview relies on the idea that there exists a being who does arbitrarily change these laws that you just said do not arbitrarily change. But why should that be so? If the universe were merely an accident, why should it obey logical orderly laws, or any laws at all for that matter? The implication here is that a god exists and is in some sort of eternal struggle against unknown forces that are working against him to change the laws of nature randomly. Why does this randomness have to necessarily exist if there is no god? What force is god fighting against and what is its origin? And why should these laws not be constantly changing since so many other things change? But why should they be? Would they be changing if not for a god? How do you know? How can you know? Is it even possible for these laws to be different? The answer to most of these questions, if they are answering honestly, is that we do not know. We don't know why the laws of physics and logic are what they are. We just invented math and language to explain them as they are. We don't know if they could be different or if they have to be what they are. And if they have to be what they are, we don't know why they have to be the way they are. You just look at all of these we don't know answers and assume that God is a good enough answer for you. The Bible explains this. There are orderly laws because a logical lawgiver upholds the universe in a logical and consistent way. Why does the universe need upholding? Would it not have been more practical for God to make it self-sustaining? Why would he make a universe that requires him to actively force it to behave as it should, instead of one that can run by itself and only changes when he actively intervenes? God does not change, so he sustains the universe in a consistent way. The fundamental laws of the universe do not change, so they sustain the universe in a consistent way. There, I fixed it for you, with the added benefit that if we ever do observe a change in the fundamental laws of the universe, we aren't dogmatically tied to them remaining constant, we are instead just trying to describe them as we observe them. Only a biblical worldview can account for the existence of science and technology. Now, does this mean that a non-Christian is incapable of reasoning logically or doing science? Not at all, but he is being inconsistent. The non-Christian must borrow from the above biblical principles in order to do science or to think rationally. Quite the contrary, there is nothing in your worldview that gets us to a scientific and rational worldview. The scientist observes the universe, describes what can be described, and attempts to gain new understanding for that which at the moment cannot be described. The creationist worldview observes the universe, ignores several of the descriptions that are already well known, and attempts to suppress any research into areas that they are scared of in order to push the idea of God into the unknown parts of the universe and how it operates. But this is inconsistent. The unbeliever must use biblical ideas in order to use science and reason while he simultaneously denies that the Bible is true. What Bible verse lays out the scientific method and peer review process? What Bible verse tells us the laws of logic? None. The books of the Bible are written as though those authors had an intuitive and sometimes flawed understanding of how such things work. And it is quite telling that as many times as I have heard apologists argue that there are laws of logic that can be found in the Bible, they never quote any Bible verses that actually plainly state any of the laws of logic. They can only point to instances where some aspect of the story says something works in a way that is at least somewhat in accordance with the laws of logic. So who created God? By very definition, an eternal being has always existed. Nobody created him. Okay, I define the singularity as being eternal. There, problem solved. The singularity is eternal. Nobody needed to create it. It has always existed. 
Now please explain. Why do you get to do that for God, but I don't get to do that for the singularity? Think about it this way. Everything that has a beginning requires a cause. And it is entirely possible that the universe had no beginning, ergo requires no cause. And if it did have a beginning, then that just means it had a cause, not that we know exactly what that cause even is. Also, that's just an assumption to begin with. We don't actually have any examples of anything that have truly begun to exist. So we can't say for certain how a thing with a beginning would have been able to begin or how it would not have been able to begin. So until we have actually been able to examine something that truly did have a beginning in this sense, then the fact of the matter is that we don't know how it would have begun or even whether or not it had a cause. There is nothing illogical about an eternal being who has always existed even though it might be difficult to fully understand. Well, then, by extension, there is nothing illogical about an eternal universe even though it might be difficult to fully understand. You might argue, but that means I have to accept this by faith because I can't totally understand it. No, I'd argue that we withhold belief until we have a better understanding. Right now, there is no evidence that points to a god. The best you've been able to do is to point out a few things that we don't fully understand, and then conclude that because we don't understand it, it must be impossible, therefore god must have done it, and then turned right around and said that the only reason the laws of nature don't change is because god exists to keep them stable. But if the laws of nature were subject to change, then something impossible, like the origin of life, would be possible. We'd just need the laws of nature to have changed to accommodate it. So you're wrong, but even if you're right, then you're still wrong. And that's basically it. They go into why they believe the Bible rather than other religious texts, and spoiler, it amounts to saying because I like it best. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Shay Zeus, who says, why exactly would there be global stories of an event that killed every human on Earth except one family? This is a common question I get on videos that deal with the creationist point about how most cultures have a flood myth. Who recorded the myth if everyone died in the flood? Well, the idea as I understand it is not so much that these cultures all existed at the time of the flood, and so somehow remembered the flood as it happened in their region, it's that all of humanity was wiped out in this one flood, leaving only Noah and his family to remember it, but then after the Tower of Babel when people spread out over the earth, as the story was retold and cultures developed, they developed their own version of the same root story. Of course, the data doesn't bear this out, there is not a radiation pattern of more changes to the story happening farther away from the Middle East you get, and this also brings you to the conclusion that the Epic of Gilgamesh was probably a more accurate depiction of the event, as it was recorded sooner after the Flood than the version found in the Bible. Thanks for watching, special thanks as always to my patrons, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the cyanide that reacts with the iron that is my channel. If you'd like to become a simple sugar, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time! 